From the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. Prince Charles has made a call in the Evening Standard for big business to put trillions into environmental projects, and we think he's right. What he's saying is that now finally that penny has dropped and big business and big finance in particular see the profit in uh, backing green and sustainable investments. The Standard's Jonathan Prynne on why the quiet power of money is louder than the climate protesters' noise. Also... The ultra-low emission zone, or ULES charge, is six months old and one driver owes £13,000. We've got more on that and five other things we've learned about the scheme. And... I'm in Tokyo where tomorrow, well, down the road in Yokohama, tomorrow England are going to take on the All Blacks in their first World Cup semi-final for 12 years. If England beat the All Blacks, they're in the Rugby World Cup final. We're in Japan for all the excitement, but also where to find it back home. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, Prince Charles wants our financial giants to support green technology. We think the city should act on his words. It seems unlikely we'll ever find Prince Charles handcuffing himself to a car in Trafalgar Square, but he has been one of the world's most vocal and influential climate campaigners since long before the rebellion took to the streets. He has no intention of stopping and has spoken exclusively to the Evening Standard to tell the UK's bankers it's up to them to save the planet. The interview is fascinating and you can read it in the paper and online. Here's what our editorial column made of it. It's a commendable attempt by the heir to the throne to use his influence to speed up action against the dangers of climate change. The role of finance in supporting the development and expansion of green technologies will be crucial in helping the world make the shift away from harmful carbon-based industries in favour of sustainable alternatives. The timing of the prince's intervention is pertinent too coming as it does only days after the end of the Extinction Rebellion protests in London earlier this month. However noble the activists' objectives, it is the quiet power of money, not the protesters' noise on the streets, that can and must do most to tackle the threat of climate change. Well, the standards, Jonathan Prynne, worked on this story. Jonathan, what is the Prince trying to get out here today? You know, for decades, he's been promoting his opinions about um, sustainability, saving, the, protecting the, the planet from uh, over-exploitation and so on. And I, and I think he's always felt rather frustrated that the organisations and institutions that fund uh, investment have never quite come on board. So it's been a lot of sort of aspiration, but not a lot of actual achievable investment in, in sort of green schemes and so on. I think what he's saying is that now finally uh, that penny has dropped and big business and big finance in particular are now really, really keen uh, and see the profits as well, crucially, in uh, backing green and sustainable investments. This must be some vindication for Prince Charles because, as you've mentioned, he's talked about this for a very, very long time, hasn't he? He has, and I, I'm, I think it's... A huge, or he will certainly feel it's a huge vindication that the subjects that these subjects that he raised so long ago, when they were deeply unfashionable, are now becoming absolutely not just mainstream, but uh, beyond mainstream, seen as absolutely essential, you know, for the for the future safeguarding of the of the planet and the environment. Now he's not given an interview like this for no reason. I wonder if he thinks just a little extra nudge, a little extra push will encourage more city companies, more of those big financial companies to get involved. Do you think it will? Do you think he has that influence? I think he does have influence, um, but ultimately uh, investors will only go where the returns are. Um, that's just the the reality of, of uh, capitalism, I, I guess. But I think for him to, to sort of highlight the point, raise the profile, make people think, act as a, in that horrible phrase, as a, as a thought leader, uh, I think all of that is is 
going to bring influence to bear. At the same time, in parallel with what Prince Charles is saying, there's a lot of pressure on investment funds, uh, pension funds, to divest their fossil fuel investments in particular, the BPs and the Shells and so on, in order to become sort of fossil free, fossil or carbon free investments. Even MPs are doing that. There's uh, this week 300 MPs signed um, a motion to uh, urging the Parliamentary Pension Fund to sell off its BP and Shell shares as a sort of gesture to become carbon free investors. Next. Six surprising facts about the first six months of the ultra low emission zone in London and how to enjoy the Rugby World Cup if, unlike our Will McPherson, you're not in Japan. The Standard backed the introduction of the ultra-low emission zone in London and it looks like the scheme's been a success. From our audio news team, here's Freddy Tennyson with six facts from its first six months. London's ultra-low emission zone, or ULES, was hailed as one of the toughest emission standards of anywhere in the world. Mayor Sadiq Khan said it was needed to tackle a health emergency. Drivers of older, more polluting cars are slammed with heavy charges to enter London's congestion zone. Vehicles that don't meet the strict European emissions criteria face a £12 charge to enter parts of the capital at any time, every single day of the year. Six months on, here are six things that we've learned. Number one. Toxic fumes in the capital have dropped by a third. The mayor claims that the plan's implementation is directly linked to a 36% reduction in pollution from nitrogen dioxide. Number two, that reduction might still not be enough. Central London still breaches legal limits of nitrogen dioxide with some notable exceptions from the charge, almost a quarter of cars within the zone still surpassed the ULES standard. Number three, and if the pollution wasn't enough to make you cough <coughs> and splutter, the first three months saw over 300,000 people slammed with fines. They range from an eye-watering 160 pounds to a thousand for a lorry. Number four, one driver has racked up over 13,000 pounds of fines after she drove her Ford Focus into the zone 81 times in the first three months since it was introduced. She is thought to be the most prolific of the ULED's evaders. Number five. Savvy homeowners on the outskirts of the zone have been renting out their driveways to those who want to avoid the fine, according to the RAC. Number six, car maker Nissan says that 60% of buyers in the UK are considering making an electric vehicle their next car purchase as a direct result of the ULES scheme. So despite the burden, plans for ULES to expand to all of the city inside the North and South circulars are in action and expected to hit by 2021. So if you plan to drive your Morris Minor, say from Selsey Bill to Muswell Hill, well, you better be prepared to fork out or face a heavy fine. We hope its success continues and you can hear more from our audio news team with our morning bulletin sent to smart speakers at 7am. Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. Now. England play New Zealand's All Blacks in an eagerly anticipated semi-final clash as the Rugby World Cup approaches its climax. It promises to be a thrilling encounter. The standards Will McPherson's in Japan for the tournament and is with us now. Will, in your piece for the paper, you say it's a spine-tinglingly exciting encounter. Why is that? Win this game and Wales or South Africa would await in the final. Uh, I mean, New Zealand are a, are a tournament favourite, so beat them, and England, you know, sort of by proxy become the favourites. New Zealand have already beaten South Africa, uh, and Wales, unfortunately, over the last, last week or so, injuries have really begun to tell on a squad that just probably isn't quite deep enough to, to, to manage them. They've got such a small player base. 
Wales compared to England, but they've had a couple of big injuries and they can't really afford that. So England, I think England would be the favourites for the tournament if they could somehow beat the All Blacks tomorrow. Obviously, that's no foregone conclusion at all. So a lot of pressure then. How's the man in charge of England, Eddie Jones, taking it all? He said that... Uh, 160 million Japanese people would all be rooting for the All Blacks. So it's their second team. Japan went out last weekend, of course, which is a great shame. But there, he, he says that rather than supporting him, he's a bit of a hero here because of his time as coach of Japan, that they will all be rooting for the All Blacks. Uh, whether that's quite true or not, is I'm not sure, but we'll learn tomorrow. The All Blacks certainly uh, have that mystique about them and the Japanese seem to buy into that. So I think a lot of the neutral support will go towards them. Well, the weather's been such a huge issue with this tournament. How's it looking at the moment? It's been absolutely tipping it down here today. Two, two weeks ago, we were dealing with a, with a typhoon that saw England's game against France called off, uh, and now it feels like it's monsoon season here. It's, uh, yeah, it's been torrential rain. England, England did their captain's run, which is sort of their final warm-up today. Uh, it was some puddles on the pitch and all that kind of stuff. It should be absolutely fine tomorrow. Are England going to win. It's the All Blacks and it's, <laughs> uh, it's about breaking up a dynasty when you play them. It's not just about beating a rugby team, it's about beating a nation and beating a sort of a, a, tr- a, a huge force in global sport. They just sort of churn out talent. They're, they're a well-oiled machine. Steve Hansen, their coach, was coached four years ago. Many of the same team remain, but they've also had a sort of major generational change and that doesn't actually matter to them. They just keep producing talent despite being this tiny country of four million people or so they just they just keep on churning out incredible rugby players England on the other hand have sort of they, they've had this mixed bag for the last well they, they, they won the World Cup in 2003 which was the sort of famous high point of a game in England and have been you know they've been pretty disappointing since actually they, but under Eddie Jones they've had this sort of resurgence they won 18 games in a row and they uh, and they've arrived at this World Cup somehow they've managed to keep a lot of their top players fit and they look a really good side <laughs> Well, we can't all be in Tokyo for the game, but the excitement's definitely travelled back home to London. A lot of people have been caught up in the hype, including our features writer Katie Strick, who's here now. Katie, what's making people so excited about this one? I had the very important task of writing the bluffer's guide for today's paper, which was probably very appropriate because I am not an avid rugby fan, I must admit. I have definitely been someone who's kind of been drawn into the World Cup in the late stages. But actually, I think that's what a lot of people have found. And in a way, that's what's fun about it is that things like the World Cup do draw in fans, you know, who wouldn't otherwise watch throughout the year. And I think it's exactly what we need right now, which is that London is just love coming together and having something to celebrate and being part of something bigger, especially this week. It's a fun way to come together on a Saturday morning in your pyjamas on a rainy day. Yeah, that is the difference between something like the Football World Cup. This is nine in the morning. How, yes. you, <laughs> how do you celebrate or how do you kind of get the same kind of atmosphere in your own house? Well, it's a good Good point. I was with my my sister and her boyfriend last weekend and her boyfriend was buzzing. It was about 11 a.m. when I met up with him and he'd been up since seven. He'd cycled down to his friend's house. They'd all gathered around, about 10 of them in the house. And I think that was actually part of the fun that you're inside, you're all in your pyjamas. It's actually very rare these days as a Londoner that you kind of get together with your friends in that way at someone's house first thing in the morning. And, you know, Deliveroo is doing great offers. Lots of pubs are offering bottomless breakfasts. My favourite was a um, Guinness-inspired coffee at Flatiron Square, if you go there. So That's if you can drag civilized. yourself out. <laughs> almost civilised. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that feeling of camaraderie. I mean, as everyone knew from the Football World Cup last year, you know, it was just that feeling that you're all in something together and um, you can go to the pub and actually have something in common with the person next to you and talk to people on the tube for the one and only time. There's also always the human side. There's a lot more, there's a lot more to it. The Barrett brothers, who are these three brothers that are all on the New Zealand side this year, who I think are the second time three brothers have ever appeared in a World Cup national side together. Having said that, you wouldn't want to be the youngest of the three, Geordie, who is actually on the bench tomorrow, not playing while his two brothers are in the starting line. So um, that's something to say if you feel like you want to say something like you know what you're talking about. (laughs) And that's The Leader. It's our opinion, but we'd love to hear yours. Get in touch through social media with the hashtag The Leader Podcast. And you can give your opinion of this very podcast itself. Rate us on your provider and subscribe as well to make sure you get us every day at 4pm. We're back on Monday.